This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's that time of year again. Every fall, we get a new iPad. This time, it's the iPad Air 2. Is it airier? Well, I guess so. It's even a little bit thinner and a little bit lighter. Impossibly crazy thin, 6.1 millimeters thin. We're going to look at it now. So here it is, Apple's yearly dose of 9.7-inch tablet goodness. This is the second generation of the iPad Air. We're talking many generations of the iPad itself at this point. As you might guess, Apple sort of does what Intel does with their CPUs on a TikTok cycle, which means that every other release, big things change. For example, the Air last year was a big change because it got so much thinner and so much lighter. And this one is also very thin and light. But this one's just a little bit thinner. I mean, how thin can you go? You still have to have a circuit board, memory, a battery and stuff inside of here. But it is a little bit thinner at 6.1 millimeters. If you have a case for the original iPad Air and you are upgrading, it probably would fit. I mean, we're, we're talking not a huge difference here at this point, but Apple has moved around some of the controls and the microphone holes and stuff like that too. Sneaky Apple. It's also a teeny bit lighter. The last one was 1.06 pounds for the Wi-Fi model. Now it's 0.96 pounds, so just under one pound. It's inconsequentially light, relatively speaking, compared to what we're used to. Just a couple of years ago, tablets were like one and a half pounds for the mobile OS tablets, Android and iOS, that is. Windows tablets, couple of pounds. So there it is. Change right here. We have the home button and yes it is now the fingerprint scanner for Touch ID. Uh, that's really kind of nice because you know once you got used to having an iPhone with that and then you switch over to your iPad and you're like well, why isn't the button unlocking it? Hmm. Now it does. Works the same way as it does on the iPhone. Works very well. One caveat, though, this is a much bigger device. With, with a phone, you tend to always hold it the same way in your hand when you use the sensor. With this, there's a variety of ways you might be picking it up. So you can do a bunch of fingers. You can scan it at different angles. But it, it's a little trickier, I think, to find just the right angle that you originally registered it at, unless you're way more consistent than me, which you may be. Nothing on the side over here except for lovely chamfered metal. As a usual, aluminum unibody. The whole thing is glued together. No screws. No easy taking a party here. Sorry. Up top, the microphone jack. Microphone slash headphone combo jack, actually. There's the power button. A little bit skinnier because the whole device is skinnier. Here we have our volume controls. There's a microphone hole right there. There is no longer a microphone hole up top. No slide lock button so you can't use that say for your orientation lock. It, I kind of miss it. You get used to it because the tablet is very responsive to, to orientation change when you're moving it around but now that's done with software in the settings if you swipe down from the bottom or swipe up rather. Oh well that's the price we pay for thinness. Speakers right down here are lightning port in between the two speakers. We got stereo sound and what's important here? Well if you're a fan of gold this is important. New for the iPad Air 2, just like the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, you can get this in gold. It's still available in silver or space gray, but now you have the option of getting it in gold, which looks pretty nice. Doesn't look too tacky or anything like that. Still 9.7 inches, and comparing it to what I call my iPad Micro here, the iPhone 6 Plus, if you're thinking, well, the iPad mini is probably not a significant jump up in size. There you go, the, the 9.7 one inch one still is, obviously. This is the iPhone 6 Plus again, the big boy. So big competitor from the world of Android back here is the Samsung Galaxy Tab S 10.5, a little bit bigger, 10.5 inches. Different aspect ratio, of course, but still both remarkably thin and light. So for those of you who are wondering how they, well, Literally stack up. There it is. Both very skinny. The The iPad Air 2 is just a hair thinner. I mean, honestly, they're both so thin, it doesn't matter. The iPad Air Wi-Fi version is 0.96 pounds versus 1.03 pounds. Really, you're not going to feel that, that small of a difference between the two of these. So both of them have very high resolution to screens, and they are at the top of the tree for their respective platforms. They have them together so you can see how they look. And then there's the back view, of course. Uh, let's be honest, most people are probably going to say this is the better looking product because it's all metal, sleek, aluminum, unibody design. Samsung still goes with their faux leather, pleather, plastic back here, stippled. It's not a bad looking tablet. It's kind of the Galaxy S5 era of design. We have the shiny faux metal around the edges. This one happens to be the so-called bronze color, which is actually brown. 
So the difference in look there. Of course, the nice thing about this is it is very grippy. It doesn't show fingerprints too, too much. Obviously, our spotlights are still catching a little bit of reflection here, but one of the things that is new for the display is we got optically bonded glass here, it's laminated on. It does something that Apple's been doing for, for their phones for a while. We've seen that in some other tablets like Surface Pro 3. Makes the icons look even more painted on. It is gorgeous looking. It reduces reflection somewhat. There's also an anti-reflective coating on here. Is it less than the last generation iPad Air? Yes, definitely. If I try to use it as a mirror with the screen off, I mean, I could really examine the cracks between my teeth with the original iPad Air. Here, I get a decent but not really super clear idea of what's going on with my teeth, if you're going to use it for that sort of thing, that is. But just to give you an example, it still will reflect. It is still a glossy piece of glass, so it's not immune to reflections. Now, it's not matte, but it does make it easier to see outdoors, say, if you're using it for something like photography. Now, some reviewers make fun of you for doing that. I'm not going to do that. Whatever camera you like is the camera that you should use, whatever you have with you. Also, there are so many people that are finding creative uses for the cameras on tablets, for example, using it for sports, helping the team get better, the coaches, filming you and showing you exactly how you perform. There's all sorts of logical uses, actually, for a tablet. Hence, Apple did improve the camera, 8 megapixel eyesight camera as they call it on the back still records 1080p video sorry no 4k video recording there fast f.24 lens on there the usual auto hdr you get your slow motion you get your time lapse or fast motion recording just like you do on the iphone 6 and 6 plus is it as good as the iphone 6 and 6 plus no not quite though those cameras are pretty stunning particularly the iphone 6 plus with its optical image stabilization but it is improved over the iPad Air, and I think it's plenty good enough for most folks taking pictures just for their own enjoyment and even using it for sports use. Certainly, it's one of the better tablet cameras. Samsung Galaxy Tab S 10.5, for those of you who are also thinking about Android, also has a pretty nice rear 8 megapixel camera on it, too, for the competition. Our front FaceTime camera, as it's called, because Apple assumes you might be using it for FaceTime video chatting, is 1.2 megapixel, 2.2 lens on there, 720p video recording. It's not bad. It's decent. It's not, oh my god, wow, it's a 5 megapixel super duper selfie camera, but it gets the job done, and it also has HDR. So how does this compare to the original iPad Air size-wise? Well, there they are. Skinnier and skinnier, right? I mean, they're both so skinny, it's almost hard to tell. When you pick them up and you hold them, you can tell the difference. If it's your first time, it's my hand to you, you might not guess which one was which one. But once you have, you can see there's actually, well, you know, there's a millimeter can make a difference right there. The weight, you can't really tell too much. The box itself just says iPad Air on it, whether you get the first or second gen, so there's no hint there. And this one, obviously, was the space gray model, which is the one that has the black face on it for our last gen. In terms of reflection, I think you can see even here we're picking up more reflection. Aha, see this? This wasn't happening on the second gen, so that anti-reflected coating and the bonded glass do make a difference. In terms of specs, inside 2 gigs of RAM, that's a, that's a nice jump there for Apple. means better multitasking faster. And given the fact that the CPU in this, the Apple A8X, is so darn fast, it's going to engender a desire for more multitasking, I think. Here's the thing. Apple has not changed the way you multitask very much. It's the usual. And you swipe through and you pick whatever thing it is that you want. You can switch back and forth, you know pretty quickly. No fancy split-screen multitasking like you have on Samsung tablets. I would like to see Apple start to think about how to make better use of multitasking, since this is one of the most powerful tablets, especially mobile OS tablets, ever made. That A8X, apparently, according to Geekbench, has three cords, not the usual dual core. And here's our results. This is absolutely phenomenal. Even the single core number is pretty darn impressive there. If you have a three-year-old MacBook Air, well, this has about the same amount of horsepower according to synthetic benchmarks. And the multi-core, that's getting up there with some Intel laptops. Now, you're still looking at a mobile CPU, and it depends on whether applications are ever going to use all those cores at once. So take that with a grain of salt. This still is not exactly a laptop replacement, though I know a lot of you actually use it as such because you've got keyboard cases out there. There's some pretty good video editing applications, including iMovie and so on. So very good performance there. When it comes to other synthetic benchmarks, we've got 3D Mark on here as well. 
You can see our score, 21,681. That's a very good score. That's not a mind-boggling score. It's not gone up as much as the CPU, but certainly it holds its own very nicely against the competition. For Antutu, we saw 63,152. That's in a world where mobile OS tablets, typically that's been an Android benchmark. It's now available also for the iPad Air. The, usually 40 to 44,000 we consider state-of-the-art awesome, good. So even the Tegra K1 really is not looking as powerful as what Apple has inside of here, according to the synthetic benchmarks anyway. Sun Spider, we got a 294 millisecond result where lower numbers are better. That's about the best that you're going to see on any phone or mobile OS tablet. In fact, it's faster than some Windows laptops running on Celeron and Pentium CPUs. Pricing is same as it ever was in your choice of silver, space gray, or gold. That's $4.99 for the Wi-Fi only model, $6.29 for the LTE 4G model, which this guy is like the iPhone. It has 20 different LTE bands in there. That's quite an engineering feat. And Apple is going with their new multi-carrier, carrier agnostic SIM. It can actually be a chameleon SIM and work on T-Mobile, AT&T, and Sprint. Now, Verizon still wants to use their own SIM, and sometimes... Carriers do do network proprietary authentication stuff using their SIMs, and they may not all want to jump on the bandwagon, but it's not the end of the road for you there. It still has SIM card slots, so you can just pop out the one that Apple provided you and put the Verizon SIM in, for example. If you get one from Verizon, it'll have one of their SIMs in it. But that's an interesting thing. Since these are sold full retail, not with contract, what's the point? They're, they're sold unlocked, so you can actually just switch from carrier to carrier as you see fit, whoever has the best monthly pricing, that sort of thing. If you wish to do that, you can do that. So 629 is the starting price. If you go up to the next model, just like with the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus, the next model is not 32 gig, it is now 64 gigs, making it kind of a, wow, no-brainer, right? If you got that extra hundred dollars to spare, to go from 16 to 64 gigs, just got to do it. Especially on the iPad, where apps, if you're into games particularly, they take up a lot of space. High quality 3D games, one to three gigs these days. If you're shooting a lot of video on this, you're going to take up Good amount of storage space, so, yeah. And then lastly, there's a 128 gig model, which, well, that's going to cost as much as a laptop there, but 829 if you want the 4G LTE plus Wi-Fi version, and it is going to be 699 if you want the Wi-Fi only model. No storage slot. It's an iPad. No storage slot. Inside, there was no room, obviously, to put an even bigger battery in this crazy, skinny, light, tablet here. 27.3 watt hour lithium ion battery sealed inside. No screws hold this together. It is all glued together. So if you need new battery, eventually happily lithium ion batteries do last usually at least two years before they start degrading. Often three these days, depending on how heavily you use it, but you're going to have to send it to Apple to get the battery replaced. Battery life is about the same as the outgoing iPad Air. We have the Wi-Fi model here, so we can't attest to the cellular longevity. Usually, LTE actually consumes more power than Wi-Fi if you're actually using the LTE connection. If you're using Wi-Fi, then no. It's just when you're using LTE. Apple claims 10 hours of web surfing time or video playback time, and that is what we have gotten. Give or take, that's about what we get on our original iPad Air, which seems to last about 15 minutes longer. Not enough to really say, you know, there's a significant difference you should care about or worry about. So sorry, it's going thinner, it's going lighter, it's not going up in battery life any, but that's still one of the better tablets in the 10-inch class for battery life. Again, the Samsung Galaxy Tab S 10.5 is the only one that outlasted, unless you put the Tab at full brightness. If they're both at full brightness, the Tab S with its Super AMOLED display is going to consume more power, but at 50% brightness, which is where we test at, or even lower, then the Tab S is actually the class leader right now for battery life. As ever with the iPad, if you want a GPS with GLONASS, you're going to have to get the 4G LTE model. The Wi-Fi model will use Wi-Fi triangulation. does not have a hardware GPS inside. Given how many Android tablets do have GPS inside, I kind of wish Apple would start giving that to us. This also has the M8 Motion Co. processor inside. And getting back to the Touch ID fingerprint scanner on the front right here, which works about as flawlessly as it does on iPhone with the caveat of make sure you hold the tablet in a reasonably similar manner to the way you enrolled it. You can use this for making purchases. 
Apple doesn't want you waving around your 10 inch tablet over at, you know, the local Starbucks though. So this will work for online purchases with whatever credit cards you choose to enroll in Apple Pay. This is not for waving at the point of sale. You say you're going to use your iPhone for that if you have one. So while Apple hasn't done a whole lot with multitasking here, or really with multiple users either, so yet yeah, there's something else I'd like to see them to do. For example, this is actually our senior editor's unit, and uh, I was driving senior editor crazy because every time I walked up to that person's Mac, whatever web pages I had up here start opening up on her Mac. That's continuity, that's handoff, those are some neat features. That is what Apple is focusing on. They're hoping that you get real into their ecosystem for obvious reasons. They're not the only manufacturer guilty of that strong desire there. So if you're looking at a web page here and you walk up to your Mac, because of course they want you to own a Mac, or vice versa, you hand off to your iPhone, you can have that web page open up right there. If you're working on the included page, pages, word processor, we have Keynote, we have their Excel compatible spreadsheet on here, it can automatically open up on your iPhone or your Mac or vice versa. So there's a continuity of use here. That's what they're focusing on for this version of the operating system. As to what they do with multitasking next, who knows? Of course, it's also up to third parties who make very good use of the iPad. And that gets into one of the neat things about the iPad is huge tablet ecosystem, 675,000 tablet optimized apps. And they tend to be pretty high quality too. And that still hurts a little bit. I'm more of an Android user on tablets often. I have to say the apps are often higher quality here and there, there aren't as many tablet optimized apps yet for Android. I mean, you can use them, but they're not made to really make great use of the screen real estate. Safari web browsers here is ever very fast with the, that kind of SunSpider JavaScript number. You would expect that. Beautiful sharp 2048 by 1536 display, same retina resolution that it's been. Very nice, very sharp, very good for reading. Whites are pretty white. It has the auto brightness sensor where you can control on a continuum still how bright, relatively speaking, or not bright auto brightness is, and it works pretty well. That's something I'd like to see more tablet and phone manufacturers actually make use of where you can tweak how auto brightness actually works for you. You've got GarageBand on here, you've got iMovie. It's the usual iPad with its reasonably good ability to be a productivity tool. But how about gaming? We're going to take a look at Asphalt 8, which uses Apple Metal. So you're going to get the most out of your Apple A8X CPU here, and you're going to see some really nice reflections, dirt, water splashed on the screen, and all that sort of thing as we play now. All right, we're ready to race on the Iceland track with our Audi right there in vibrant default green. Look at the reflections off of my car, especially before I get it all dirty and crashed up. That's very nice looking right there. And the level of detail, very easy on the eyes, actually makes it easier to race. It's very good. The glare off the faux camera, you well. Know. Very nice, very smooth. Clearly, I mean, I never heard anybody say, oh, my iPad Air is slow and laggy and doesn't play games well. It's not like we had a super great need for speed, but you know how it goes with this. Developers are just going to take use of the speed that they're given. We're going to see even more gorgeous 3D games, even more sophisticated video editors, all that sort of stuff. This will definitely be up to the task. It's got amazing horsepower inside, forgive the pun. So that's Asphalt 8 on the iPad Air 2 with its 1.5 gigahertz A8X CPU and two gigs of RAM. So that's the iPad Air 2. I mean, obviously iPads are pretty much a known quantity at this point. Probably a lot of you are pretty familiar with how they work. They just get thinner, faster, prettier all the time. If you already have the iPad Air, is it worth going to the iPad Air 2? Probably not so much. Last year's model is still very thin, very light. It has the same resolution display with the same level of color saturation is still a lovely unit. Yeah, it's nice to not have, you know, look, no glare, mom, not too much anyway. Things like that. And the, the, the touch ID sensor, I think, is a nice touch, but in, unless you're carrying around trade secrets in your iPad, businesses probably will really like this edition. Not so much. If you're coming from an iPad 2, an iPad 3, wow, 
one of those one and a half pounders, this is going to be a whole new world for you. It's going to seem so fast, so light. The screen is going to be more beautiful than ever. It's going to be a pleasure to hold things like ebooks on this, interactive magazines, the whole thing. It's, it's just lovely, and now it's not a burden to hold anymore. So that's the iPad Air 2, just starting to be available now at the same usual price point, $499 starting price for Wi-Fi only, $629 for the LTE 4G model that works on every major U.S. carrier with that new carrier agnostic SIM pre-installed. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to visit our website for the full written review, and don't forget to hit that like button.